With 3 million members searching, SingleMuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV, sponsored by singlemuslim.com. I'm Fahima Mohammed, your host and your relationship and couples coach. We're here tonight with another episode, and I would love to have you join in. If you want to, you can call us on 01924 231083 and do ask the bill payers permission as standard network rates do apply. If you want to either send us a WhatsApp message and you can do so anonymously, that is a free service and that number is 07-585-835-150. I have all those numbers now ready for you to get dialing, get chatting, send us all your messages, whether it's on Facebook, Twitter, or I, if you're watching on Sky Channel 752, a very, very warm welcome from all of us here on British Muslim TV. We have another topic to discuss tonight, and that is healing with purpose. If it hurts, you know, we're talking about love. If it hurts, is it really love? Now, this is something that we have spoken about in different angles, and we're going to tackle it a little bit deeper with my guest tonight, who is all the way from Scotland at this very moment in time. Thank you so much for joining me. Salaamu Alaikum, Reham Nasser. Salam. How are you tonight? I'm good, Alhamdulillah. Thank you for having me. Thank you, you so much for joining us. I'm really happy you're here today. And it's really exciting that we have this topic. I think it's really uh, something that we can get confused about, especially when we are in a relationship and we think that we should actually have pain or you know in when we're feeling love and sometimes it's healthy sometimes it's not we're going to go back into that but before we actually answer that question i want to learn a little bit about you so could you tell the audience uh what, what do you do and you're a founder of the company as well which is uh tyn which is transform you now tell us a little bit about yourself so that we can continue to get to know you and hopefully ask you some more questions Sure, I'd be honored. So my name's Reham and I was raised in the US, thus the accent. I've traveled extensively and lived in uh, on three continents. I have a master's degree in conflict analysis and resolution. So I solve problems for a living. And I'm an ICF certified coach. Um, I'm a certified NLP practitioner and an avid mental health advocate, just to name a few things. Uh, as you mentioned, I currently live here in Scotland, uh, in the UK, and I'm a blessed mother of a very cheeky young boy, or wee boy, as we say here. <laughs> um, <laughs> lovely, absolutely lovely. Tell me about the company that you have founded. So Transform You Now is a company that I work with, uh, with my team, and we offer work um, with clients that are at a crossroads in conflict and in crisis to build resilience in their relationships, uh, personal, personal and professional relationships by building healthier Muslim mindsets for those that are Muslim, fortifying a solid Muslim identity for those that are Muslim again, because we work with both Muslims and non-Muslims and enhancing their skills in communication, active listening, critical thinking, leadership, relationships, conflict resolution, leader, um, parenting, and so much more. And Amazing. the tagline for us, just to understand why the title is what it is, is healing with purpose. And that's basically why we we do what we do to, to allow people the opportunity uh, to really venture into the areas within their hearts, their minds, their soul, their body that they want to heal um, and do it consciously. Do you think that we all need some sort of healing? Because not everyone has maybe uh, trauma or we don't have, you know, experiences. Like, do you think that even regardless of people that may have had uh, no sort of like problems and not many challenges that they can't overcome themselves, would it still be possible for them to gain some sort of like, um, you know, transformation from your actual work? Absolutely. I think each and every one of us uh, was born um, complete and unbroken, uh, not needing fixing, basically. But we all 
once we come in contact with our guardians or our caretakers, then start to have areas in our, in our lives that need adjusting, as you can say. And that adjusting leads to healing. Because how do you know that you need healing? Well, then there's something that comes up for you that causes pain or discomfort that you're not comfortable with in your body, in your mind, in your heart, in your soul. And when you realize that that's the case, then healing is necessary to get you over that, that experience or to learn from it and move forward. And that's why healing is so essential. So yes, um, the short answer would be uh, as young children, we need to heal, especially when we fall over and we, we have a, um, you know, a a bruise on our, our knee or something or around our legs. And, and that needs healing by building resilience and a healthy mindset. We also need healing for our hearts when it gets broken or it gets trampled on or ghosting becomes, you know, the topic of the day. Um, you know, it really depends on what someone's going through and, and healing is a wonderful opportunity to bring all parts of our, our mind, body, heart, and soul together as a unified uh, one unit instead of us being segmented and disjointed as, as human beings. I love that. I think it's really important that what you've just said, actually, while I was listening to you, the fact that on our own, we whole, we complete, but obviously when we are sort of connecting with other people, then we can get triggered by our, you know, subconscious, unconscious mind. And that's when, you know, things pop up for us and especially in relationships. Now, when it comes to our single Muslims out there, whether they've never been in a relationship before or from a, you know, a relationship that hasn't worked out and they're starting again, there's always some sort of healing with purpose that needs to be done. And at the same time, there's always pain. Now, if you are in a relationship and you feel love and pain, is that possible? Absolutely. Uh, they go hand in hand sometimes, uh, not synonymously necessarily, but they can coincide in, in one's heart or one's life. And that comes from uh, not processing potentially everything that we're going through, suffocating some of it, uh, you know, uh, suppressing it and not allowing it to flow through us, as you can say. There's a, there's a uh, martial arts um, viewpoint on uh, being the blade of grass. Basically, the grass, the blade of grass basically allows the wind to move it but it's not broken. But when the wind is a strong gush or a, a gale wind, it could break um, or even, um, you know, uproot a tree. So which one's stronger, the tree or the blade of grass? So it's the concept of really being grounded in who you are and allowing those emotions to flow through us in order for us to be able to be resilient, to be able to be healthy in our mindset and our well-being. I mean, being with a partner, whether it's for the first time or, or after years, it can actually uh, bring about things, like I said, from the past. Um, and they do say that love hurts and it's painful because it brings growth and demands and transformation. It transforms you as well. Um, how do you think that we can relay that to our single Muslims to understand that. Because I think there's a lot of breakdown in relationships because we don't understand the concept of going into it and actually feeling uncomfortable, being okay being uncomfortable, but knowing how to work through that sort of uncomfortableness. I think that's why relationships are very rocky. And right now we're not tolerating each other and we can't understand why is it that relationships are so difficult, it's so painful. And when I'm talking about pain, yes, I'm talking about emotional pain, but there's also neuroimaging studies that show that that pain and that connection from an emotional um, sort of you know, relationship can be just as much as painful and hurt you as like a real hurt, hurt, you know, physical pain. So oh, yeah. how is it that we can um, learn about this more and bring more awareness that this is part of being with somebody, especially someone that is going to be connected to you in that way? Because I think it's such an interesting topic. I didn't even realize this kind of angle was going to come about after speaking until I spoke to you that, you know, what you do is so deep and it's so true that when you're healing with purpose, I think it's so important. Can you do 
Could you define maybe, you know, what is the actual pain that someone will feel in a relationship that is actually okay, but they can work through it? Sure. So let me lay some foundation first before we go too deep into the the depth of pain and and is it love or is it not, which is our title and how to heal. So the foundation would be uh, virtual reality is up and coming and or actually uh, really common in some areas uh, of the world. And the reason why it's so popular is because you don't have to experience it physically to experience it emotionally. So we Mm. can experience happiness as well as pain emotionally. And it still triggers and lights up the same cognitive areas in our brain that physical pain would do as well. So that's something really important to pay attention to. Another concept uh, to lay the foundation of our conversation is we attract what we're missing in our from our past in our lives now. And that basically means we fill our inner voids, our inner wounds with one of usually three things, people, temptations or addictions, or material things. So you might wonder, for example, why do people hoard? Well, it's Mm -hmm. because they feel like they're out of control and they're missing that sense of control that they lost when they were younger or at some point in their past. So they keep every single thing and they can't discard it because everything becomes sentimental. Mm -hmm. And not just some things become sentimental. So it goes off kilter, basically. I love that. You know, we are going to pick up on that because what you've said was so, so important. And we are coming into a short break. But please do stay with us. Join us as we are going to be continue uh, to question Reham. She's got amazing, intense experience and knowledge. And this conversation, I don't think we've ever really touched on as this you know, sort of deep and sort of this, uh, you know, sort of like direction to really understand, you know, when you are in a relationship and when there's pain and, you know, is that healthy? Is it something that you actually have to avoid? Is it something that you actually can work through? And that emotional pain, is it from the other person or is it from your own wound, your past, your, you know, things that you are not conscious of that actually are triggered by your relationships? So I think that when we come back from the break, we're going to have a lot more questions for you, Raham. And I hope that whoever's watching, please do stay with us. We're going to be back with Raham with more questions. We'll see you in a few moments. See you shortly. Take care. With 3 million members searching, SingleMuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV, sponsored by SingleMuslim.com. You know, my energy tonight is very mellow and it's very calm. And I guess what you were talking about before, Raham, is the fact that we can actually mirror our partners or we can actually also be triggered by certain things. And you're so calming in the way you speak that actually I'm calm as well. (laughs) So in that way, um, it's very different atmosphere. And it's so lovely to hear you speak and what you were saying and what you were talking about before the break. Could you please elaborate on that? Because it was so interesting. And um, I want you to continue with regards to um, the triggers and um, the pain and how we actually can work through it. Sure, sure. So we started with material things as the void that we're trying to fill when we have wounds that have not been healed from our past that then impact our present and our future, potentially if we do nothing about it. So another way that we have voids and wounds is when we are Um, serial daters. Dating, I mean, seeing and meeting new people, courting them, uh, and and in in the pursuit of marriage, for example. And so you'll find either you'll meet a lot of people and never commit to one, or you'll get married again and again and again and not learn from the experiences that you've experienced beforehand with other people. And so you'll, by default, repeat those same patterns, which then leads to the the title that we talked about. If it hurts, it's not love because it will hurt. 
whatever we've experienced prior will continue to follow us like baggage that's shackled to our feet. I think until what you're we... saying, sorry, Abraham. So let me make this clear. When we're talking about pain, we're talking about pain that comes from us, not the, what other person is giving us, but we sometimes might feel that it's from the other person. Is that correct? Yes. So it could be deflected from the other person, but it's a mirror of what's happening within. Sometimes though, just to be absolutely fair, sometimes it isn't us and sometimes it's what's mirrored back to our partners from within them. But we as partners to each other are mirrors for each other. Um, don't we know in Islam we're mirrors for each other? You know, we're reflections of each other. That's how we keep each other growing and advancing and becoming better personally and, and, and religiously. So that's the same mirror concept that is used in psychology. But Islam came up with it. So basically, it was a concept that was adopted. One of the many wonderful things that um, Islam brought to Western civilization that we don't get recognition for. But let me go back to people. And then I'm going to go back to the third point about the voids and the wounds. So when we um, are unable to learn from our past experiences, we carry that, as I was mentioning, shackled to our feet, for example. And that takes us into that next relationship with more baggage, with even more baggage, the more relationships you get into without taking the time to just be, to really focus on what it is that I've experienced, what it is that I've gone through, why did I do what I did, what could I have learned differently and done differently, what could I have experienced differently if I had made di different de decisions or better choices? And that's really essential to deal with the, the, the hurt or the pain that's disguised as love because we may not have had someone in our upbringing mirroring to us again, there's the mirror, what is a healthy relationship, what healthy love looks like, or we may not have felt it either. So it goes back to the healing with purpose again. And the third way to heal with purpose is to identify what temptations and addictions we struggle with that prevent us from actively dealing with the voids that we're trying to cover up or the wounds that we're trying to heal. A simple example of those would be for example, uh, porn addiction is on the rise, and so is cybersex. It's a major addiction, major issues. And another, another area um, is abuse and narcissism and toxicity in relationships. That's been on the rise, thus the increase, the amazing increase in numbers of divorces that have happened during lockdown. Uh, another example, for example, would be intoxicants. To forget what I'm going through, I need to drink it to, to, you know, drink this or that. I need to smoke. I need to take drugs. I need to do whatever to just dampen or take the edge off, dampen the pain a little bit with, with, the, with the liquor or with whatever else intoxicant it is at the time. Another way that we self-medicate, as I call it, is, uh, you know, binging on Netflix, for example, as a lot of people did during lockdown, because the void was, I'm not feeling that sense of connection with other people. Oftentimes there are people that had gone for months on end without touching another human being because they were in lockdown. Now imagine the deprivation, the isolation, the, the sense of abandonment that people may have grown up with, the void, the pain, the wound, and had no other way in their mind to resolve that pain, the wound, the hurt, except for in the ways that their brain or their mind or whatever media, um, uh, you know, advertised or socially is acceptable uh, for them to fill the void, to put the bandaid on. But do you not think, but do you not clusters. think, sorry, um, do you not think though, we're not actually brought up to be by ourselves. We are just, especially in our Muslim community, we grow up, uh, we obviously have to study and then we go straight looking for that relationship. We're never given that time to get to know ourselves. We're never given that space to learn about ourselves. Even if we're in our home with our parents, it's constant pressure to, uh, to do the next thing. And do you not feel that regardless, we can blame social media, we can blame all the other things that are around us. But we in our households 
do you not have that you know insight like you were talking about all these questions that we need to ask ourselves once we finish in a relationship how is it that anyone can do that i mean what is it that you need to do and i know for a fact as well that you do actually coach men there's a lot of women out there that only coach women i myself as well we you know i i don't have any sort of like um you know lack of coaching whether it's faith or no faith or uh, male or female um that's part of my you know my profession so and here on the platform we don't have any sort of restrictions as to who is it that we're going to allow to come in and you know speak so we do address issues not just for women it is also for men and i think you know when women also complain we need more women that are actually talking to men to make them aware of these things and we need to build and bridge that gap what's your thoughts on that well, um, this is why I coach men and boys predominantly and the women that support them. And I did that because one, I was working in a male dominated environment and that male dominated environment led me to insights and awareness about men that I might have not been privy to had I worked elsewhere or in a different environment um, with these men. And, and the more I learned, the more I researched, uh, the more I recognized that this was the clientele that I wanted to serve the most because one of the main issues that uh, I've noticed a lot of men struggle, and it's not just here in the UK, it's also in the US and Canada and Australia and several parts of the world, that they struggle with um, connecting what they're feeling with the words that they want to express about their feelings and asking for support. So those are the big no-nos oftentimes for a lot of men because it makes men look weaker. Now, I don't want to stereotype. There are so many different types of men out there. And there's so many different ways that men have been raised. And we have wonderful examples in the time of during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu where the Prophet Sallallahu nurtured men to be uh, authentic with their emotions, authentic with their thoughts and verbalize and express and experience to the fact that we even have a hadith that it illustrates the importance of hugging and physically touching your kids and affirming their importance in your life and uh, paraphrasing completely the hadith but when when the sahabi came to the prophet sallam and said you you hug and and kiss your children and he said i've never done that in the entire time that i've had my children and the prophet sallam told him go back and do it and the importance of emotional intelligence is so essential for our own mental, emotional, physical, and religious well-being. And so what had me really focus on men, especially here in the UK, was uh, being a mom to my son and seeing how he was growing up and seeing how he really was struggling to find healthy role models that mirrored men that could emotionally express what they're feeling. Now, his mom as a coach, obviously, leads him to um, explore those emotions in a way that is still masculine, in a way that is still respective of his male entity. And so one of the things that I decided to do was really start this, this campaign. It was called the Genuine Men's Chat during lockdown, especially, to allow men to feel um, that there was a greater awareness necessary to be had around their emotional, mental, physical, spiritual, and or religious well-being. And I used that platform as a coach, as a trainer, and as a public speaker to do so. And some of the questions that I, that I posed to the men um, was, uh, for example, why do women seek help and support and men don't? Why do women often openly show deeper levels of uh, emotions, for example, and men often don't? Why do women uh, take the time to improve and enhance their relationships and invest in um, you know, therapy and counseling and coaching, and men often don't? And it goes back to asking for support. Why do women express vulnerably themselves as a method of it being a strength and not a weakness to connect with others, and men often do not? So these were the questions that I kept asking the men. And I did a series long, episode, like uh, it was 12 episodes of, of these men that didn't know each other, 
to complete strangers. I brought them into a room and we discussed topics such as religion and faith and, you know, emotional intelligence and masculinity and topics that were really essential to the fabric of what makes a man a man. And you are absolutely phenomenal. And you know what? Um, I want you to actually answer those questions that you've put forward as to what is actually um, some of the uh, topics that you've discussed and what are the actual answers to them, because they're really interesting. And I think that a lot of men watching tonight can actually benefit from this show. They are looking for relationships just as much as women, and they are the ones that are putting themselves out there. So at the end of the day, they do need the extra assistance, even if you're not asking for that support. We're here tonight discussing that. So please do take advantage, do call in, send in your messages. And inshallah, we will be back with the next part of the show after a very short break. Please do stay exactly where you are and we will catch you on the other end. And inshallah, we will see you shortly. Take care and catch you soon. With 3 million members searching, SingleMuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV, sponsored by SingleMuslim.com. We're having such an amazing discussion and I can listen to you, Raham, all night. And unfortunately, I'm going to interrupt you, obviously, with more and more questions. But it's so interesting what you just mentioned just before the break with regards to all those questions that you put across to men uh, when you're actually comparing uh, as to why women do certain things and they don't. And yet, you know, we both are supposed to come together in a relationship and maybe we have different responsibilities and ways of dealing with it. But what they do seems to really be the issue or what they don't do seems to be uh, something uh, somewhat interesting. Could you give us some examples as to the questions that you've asked and what may be some of those um, answers to it so that we can really deal with why this is actually the reason for them being in that particular way? Sure, and I do wanna throw out a caveat. This is not just for Muslim men. This is also for non-Muslim men as well. And I've noticed there's a, a big portion here in Scotland that has the same mindset um, where, you know, just man up, for example, is a common phrase uh, or, uh, you know, don't be a and then fill in the blank with any derogatory term to minimize or shame or guilt trip a, a boy into feeling like he's less than when he shows emotions or he cries or uh, big boys don't cry or boys don't cry in general. And, and so that negatively uh, anchors the thought that showing deep emotions or showing emotions is not favorable or doesn't make you a man or impacts your sense of masculinity or the perception that men, that boys or men are weak when they show emotions. And so you'll, you'll even see in a lot of movies, you'll even see, you know, boys being picked on for showing emotions. And when I did a bit of research, I was looking into some of the, the schools and they teach kids in nursery, um, uh, in nursery school or um, what's equal to nursery uh, down in England, for example, um, the first few years of nursery, so the first two years or so of nursery, uh, before they actually start primary school, they are taught their emotions. They're taught what it feels like to be happy and sad and grumpy and mad. And then they go into school and then it's taught out of them. Mm. No, you need to control yourself. No, you can't show emotion. You can't express happiness to that degree. No, you can't jump up with excitement. No, you can't cry. And then we're told to tell them again, as young men who are about to embark on life and be married, now you have to show your emotions. Well, isn't that confusing? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's mixed messages, and that's not fair to any child, um, you know, young or a young adult or a, even an adult that grows up grows up with these mixed messages in their mind. It's a, it's okay. It's not okay. It, it's good to be vulnerable, but vulnerable is now no longer a strength. It's a weakness, and there's so much confusion about that. So when they have the confusion, oftentimes it's looked down upon. 
um, when they seek support, when they seek help, because then it further uh, solidifies the fact that they're weak. Mm -hmm. This is the mindset. I'm not saying this is how every man is. This is the mindset that's drilled into a lot of boys at a young age that gets them to the stage where they become meek. They become followers or alpha males that then set the trend, but they set the trend to an extent that emotions are a weakness. And I'm not going to show emotions so that I can still be an alpha male. And there's so much in the mindset of a man that goes on that we then um, uncover in greater detail and look at the blueprint of who you are. What was it like growing up? What were the messages that you grew up with? And do they still... Uh, ring true for you now? Are you honoring those messages in your life or are they no longer serving you? And we, you know, in classic coaching approach, and we kind of dive into all of that in great detail to then come out with, this is who I am as a man. Now, I don't teach any man, just to be absolutely clear, how to be a man. I don't teach a man masculinity. I don't teach a man who a man should be. I ask them, who do you want to be? It's not about me. It's about the man that I'm working with or the young boy that I'm working with or the young adult that I'm working with and how they want to define who they want to become. Because coaching is about where you are now. Let me explain what uh, counseling and therapy is first. So counseling and therapy is where you are now and then what happened in your past that has impacted your present and what can we do about it? How can we heal from that perspective? But it's past focus. Coaching is where are you now and then where do you want to go from here? How do you want to reinvent yourself? What life do you want to create for yourself? What choices do you want to make so that you can be a better human being, make impact and leave a legacy in your world and in the world of others that are around you? So that's what allows coaching to be very unique from experiencing therapy. Um, one more thing that I could throw in just quickly, just to answer this this. Uh, topic about men. Um, there are a lot of stigmas and double standards that women experience as well. So I know in many cultures, Middle Eastern, South Asian, and Latino community oftentimes raise their daughters to be wives. And the men oftentimes look at their sons with pride that they can get away with anything, oftentimes. And this tends to lead, not always, but tends to lead to potential um, narcissistic tendencies that can grow into really uh, de destructive and really, you know, challenging uh, behaviors that can then destroy relationships. Because it so becomes- So what do, sorry to interrupt you. So what do we do, especially as women, to sort of like help support and understand that because a lot of the times it's just blamed that they are not enough and like you said even as a coach you're not telling them what to do but in a relationship um, they are being told what to do you're not showing me affection you're not emotional you're these are all the things that a lot of women complain about men that they are not you know giving them time they are just always with their boys there's I get that a lot. A lot of people come to me saying, you know, my husband is just not emotional or affectionate to me at all. It's been years since I've even had a compliment. Um, how do we overcome some of those challenges? Because it becomes like such a dead relationship that that person that's with that partner now is just so zoned out and it's, it, it brings about depression. It brings about lots and lots of, you know, um, unnecessary traumatic and mental unwell-being so what do you suggest that we can do to be that support and also help guide you know through that well one i would say really get curious get curious uh with the man in your life be it a husband a father a grandparent or a child for example or a brother or uncle and ask them you know ask him the questions about well what are you doing with your time or why is this happening or you know what's underneath this what are you really looking for are you what does what does happiness look look for you this would be a really important question and i think a lot of people don't know what happiness looks like now happiness in a way is an illusion because nobody's really really happy we're not on this earth as muslims to be happy that's not the goal 
it, our goal is to submit to Allah. And when we submit to Allah, then we know that there are going to be trials and tribulations. So the question then becomes, is it really happiness or acceptance that we're after? And it's usually acceptance and submission. So how can we accept the circumstances that we're in? And what happens is people check out from relationships because they're not accepting. They're not happy with their circumstances. So it's better to just distance yourself from what it is that you're experiencing. It's almost like that void that I was telling you about earlier and that wound or that hurt that people are trying to fill the void with other things, TV, you know, sports, their boys, and not checking in because sometimes men don't have the tools. Sometimes they don't have the words. Sometimes they don't know how to operate at that time because the training, the, the, the necessary training that is needed is at an early stage. It's when you're raising a child at that tender age of two, three, four, because a child develops their understanding of what a healthy relationship is by the age of seven. So imagine if, he, if a child saw a healthy relationship, then that's what they're going to mirror. That's going to be what they're going to project. But oftentimes, now there are exceptions to every rule, but that is oftentimes the way that it goes. And what happens is if they saw toxicity, if they saw, you know, silent treatment, if they saw, um, you know, a, a, a passive aggressive behavior, uh, jabs um, at each other, uh, you know, everything that happens in some relationships that is not healthy, then they then mirror that and accept it. So one of the things that happens is there's a problem with the disconnect between what they want and what they need to offer themselves. And that disconnect comes from one, attachment. How did they attach to their parents early on or their, their guardian? Two, uh, inner child work. Now, I just finished I think it was like a two hour talk on inner child work and inner child wounds and mother father wounds. And there's a lot to be gained and learned from that and, and to be explored in therapy. And after you've done therapy, then you can come to coaching to see how you can implement that into your life. And the reason why I bring up mother father wounds is because when we're young and we are feeling um, like, okay, let me, let me set foundation. So the foundation here is um, any child filters information about their experience differently when they're a child because their cognitive ability hasn't been up to par. It hasn't, it's not developed enough uh, as would be with an adult. And so, for example, when a child is um, left waiting for their parent to pick them up from, let's go back to nursery again, before primary school, and their child, uh, their parent is late, the child then processes maybe processes. If they come from a secure family, then alhamdulillah, oftentimes that doesn't happen. But what happens is they then develop this limiting belief in their mind that I'm not worthy enough. I'm not lovable. I'm easily abandoned. And that carries them as into, into adulthood, unchecked oftentimes, because who knows what's going on in their head. And it doesn't I could listen choose. to you all night, but unfortunately, we are coming to a break right now, and we are going to pick it up. It's going to be the final break that we have, but we are have uh, we've got Rehan with us for the next uh, few moments uh, after the break, anyway. So please do send in your messages or any calls or queries that you have. It's absolutely interesting what's been happening so far in the conversation, and the learning is so so essential, as you mentioned. We're learning a lot tonight, and join us in a few moments where we will be having um, more questions for Raham. And if you want to learn more about the mindset, how about love, if it hurts or not, we'll be discussing all of that here tonight. Join you in a few moments. Members searching, singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors Single Muslim Live. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV, sponsored by singlemuslim.com. We're here with the final part of the episode tonight. And honestly, Raham, you're so calming in the way you speak. And, you know, the information you've given us so far is just 
really, really essential for all of us to understand more about our mindset, the way in which we are actually um, brought up and how it has such a deep, deep impact on all of us. And we're talking a lot about men's mindset tonight, which I love. And I think that hopefully um, a lot of us can gain. It's men and women's going to gain from this tonight, definitely. Now, you were talking about, you know, um, healthy love. How would you define healthy love? I think that's a really interesting sort of concept. Is there such a thing as healthy love? And if so, how can you define it? Absolutely. I think there is... Uh... There are many examples of healthy love. A healthy love is when you want for others just as much as you want for yourself, not more, but just as much in the sense that you don't want to put other people first beyond your ability to provide for yourself as well. So I'll give you an example. So healthy love uh, looks like... Um, the love of uh, the Prophet uh, Ibrahim salam, and his wife, uh, Sara, for example, and his ability to be her protector and her provider, especially when the, um, the uh, ruler wanted her for himself and he was smart enough to understand the situation, emotionally intelligent enough to to set up a scenario in which he could still be by her side without her having her be harmed um, if, if the ruler knew that she was married, for example, because he wanted him, he wanted her for his wife. Um, another uh, healthy way of loving would be, for example, between a mother and a child and our, our mother Maryam uh, السلام, and what she did for Isa to keep him, you know, healthy and protected. The mother um, uh, of, of Isa also had to endure so much pain and anguish um, to trust that her son was going to come back to her. That's Musa, sorry, I apologize. The mother of Musa, I was trying to move on. The mother of Musa, when when uh, she had to endure the pain and anguish to let go of her son and have tawakkul in Allah and, and put him in um, in the river. Uh, and Allah ordered his sister to follow along and brought uh, Musa back to his mother to for her to breastfeed. That is a type of love that Allah gives us and it's also a type of love that we can give each other. Now, another way that we can say it between two consenting adults would be when two people are connected and they better each other. They better their deen, they better their mindset, they better um, their their emotional health, their well-being, there's trust, there's respect, there's loyalty, there's honesty and transparency. There's a commonality in core values. Those, those are examples of core values that align and both are learning to grow together mm -hmm. or separately, but not in a way that competes with the other. So you're both working as a team, but not as enemies or competitors. That's healthy love. And we That's have amazing. many examples, many examples in our, in our history, alhamdulillah. That is so lovely the way you described that. I wasn't expecting that answer actually, but you've given the perfect example with the most, you know, obviously you can, you know, compare with the role models that you've just sort of said. Um, does, um, I've got a few questions here. It's like um, couples basically who love so much and one loves more than the other that it's so painful. How do they overcome that? And how do they keep that sort of like in check? Because I, I think that when we say love hurts and it's painful, it's usually because it's um, one-sided mainly as well. So how would you get yourself back in balance? Because I think sometimes when we're in a relationship, you said that it's good when we have that healthy relationship where both parties are in that particular way, but usually it's not that balance. We, we have one who's more supportive, one that's more loving, one that's more caring, one that's more affectionate, all of these things. Between a couple tonight, if they have these issues and it's not balanced, how do they get that balance? Well, one, reconnect with Allah. And and I'm not saying that, you know, uh, flippantly. I say it because when we know who we're serving, then everything is balanced in our lives. When we know that we serve Allah and through serving Allah, then we are able to be the best partner that we can be to our husband or our wife. That means that if our husband or wife, assuming is not toxic or abusive, um, is needing something, then we're coming from a space of compassion. We're coming from a space of acceptance. We're coming from a space of forgiveness. You know, we're giving them the 72 plus excuses. We're not assuming, we're not jumping to, uh, to conclusions. We're not 
uh, you know, uh, trying to um, pigeonhole them into what we perceive them to be. We accept them for who they are. Now, that could seem very unrealistic because we just don't live in that kind of world. But when we serve Allah, meaning another way of looking at it is we don't and this is a tricky way of saying it, but I'm going to try to explain it in the best way that I can. When we don't worship our partner and always put Allah first, and I mean that by saying when we allow our deen to take a second um, step or a second level below our partner, it's that one-sided love that elevates beyond that love of Allah, then that's not healthy. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is if it's one-sided and the other uh, partner has completely disassociated, one person can create shifts. Imagine a pebble in a pond or in a lake. It creates ripples. Even one person can, can create change. So start with yourself. Again, serve Allah first. Um, let that be the guide in which becomes your GPS when you're navigating with your partner. If they're rude or insensitive or, or checked out, continue to operate in a way that is serving Allah. Because at the end of the day, they're going to begin to notice, well, why are they doing this? Why, you know, why is my partner continuing to be this way? They're going to notice, you know, people are not completely blind. And Allah reminds people with signs, with tests, with tribulations. And sometimes it, it just takes a reminder of, you know, the reality of, of life and death. You know, we, we know that in Surah Al-Takathur, Al-Hakum Al-Takathur, we are so busy with what we want and gathering and more, 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 that we're not reminded by what's important, which is the fact that we will meet our death. We will meet our maker, Allah. We will return to him. And when we know that we're going to return to him, then we come from a space that's more grounded, more aligned, and more focused and conscientious. And that's what serving Allah really means. It's that la ilaha illallah and Muhammadan Rasulullah that the Prophet Sallallahu Sunnah and the Quran, the rules and the regulations that we live by, are equally applied where where necessary. One last way to look at it for any couple that's struggling at this time uh, find the fun in the relationship. Sometimes couples have gotten to the point where they're so serious and it's so transactional, meaning if you do this, I'll do that. If you don't do it, I'm not going to do it. And that's what I mean by serving Allah. Do it because Allah reminds us that that is the best thing to do. And we operate from a perspective of doing the best for our partner. We're not Beautiful. looking for a return. Beautiful. And that's the um, that is absolutely Allah. Yeah, that is absolutely beautiful and so profound. Um, I, I mean, that answer is, you know, absolutely exceptional. We do have last five minutes of the show. I'd like you to close with whatever it is that you would like to say, final thoughts, plus how do people reach you and um, some tips as well, just to take away. So please, um, this is your time. Sure. Um, so um, if you're if you're looking to redefine who you are or you're confused or lost or disconnected in any way, jumping into a personal relationship development uh, program is essential because it'll get you off the ground in any relationship, be it platonic or intimate, meaning with a brother or sister, a mother or father, a friend, a co-worker, or an intimate partner like a husband or a wife. And so that's one of the classes that we offer, the master classes that we offer. Um, and every year, I do three major master classes when it comes to relationships. That's the first one. So it's the pre pre marital education because it's not specific for, for marriage, but it does get you prepared for marriage. And then the second master class that I have is the pre marital course, and that's going to happen inshallah after Ramadan. Um, after Eid, inshallah. Uh, and then the third one is many of my clients tend to get married during that summer period. And so I offer them uh, a, another course to get them thriving through their first year of marriage. So it's best to be supported than to be out there alone um, after that first year of marriage, inshallah. And um, so just going back to, you know, the topic at hand, we talked about healing with purpose. And if it hurts, it's not love. Well, if it hurts in the sense that if it doesn't make you better, if it doesn't elevate you, if it doesn't make you feel whole and confident and secure and grounded and psychologically safe, which means safe from here, here, 
and in in the presence of your partner. You're not walking on eggshells. You're not fearing their concerns about how critical they're going to be or what they're going to say or do to you because they don't see you as an equal or, you know, valuable or important. That's where it hurts. It doesn't have to physically hurt. Obviously, we know abuse is not acceptable in any religion and especially not in ours. So hurt doesn't mean physical. It means emotional. It means intellectual. It means financial hurt. It means cultural hurt. It means religious hurt. It means misusing the dean to turn and manipulate a situation for their own gratification, whoever that partner may be. So may Allah guide us all to recognize that we can heal and to really recognize what those areas are thank you so much if anybody is affected by tonight please do make sure you take care and you can contact us on britishmuslim.tv forward slash support thank you so much Raham, for everything that you've said it's been absolutely beautiful tonight's episode has been so vital um if you want to get hold of Raham, how do we do that Raham? quickly before we end Sure, Instagram, transform.u.now. Perfect. Make sure that you do uh, stay in touch with us, Reham. Thank you so much for tonight, all your insights. I love doing these shows every week. It's valuable because we do have a lot of issues and relationships is the top number one topic that always comes about again and again. We have several emails coming to us, which I try to answer. And inshallah, you know, keep them coming through. I'm trying to filter through them as best I can through the team behind us here. And we are trying our best to only just help and elevate your relationship. Inshallah, you have a wonderful evening. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. Have a wonderful evening tonight and make sure that you do take care. And inshallah, we will see you next week. Have a lovely night. Take care. Salam. 